Blender 4.2 is released, and there are a few things that are new for the creation of interactive tools using geometry nodes. You now have the power to exactly control where the tool takes effect in the 3D viewport by clicking on it. If you go to the release notes page on blender.org and scroll down to the geometry notes section, you can see a little demo file where I'm presenting how you can create this kind of impact fracture effect wherever you click on your model. In this video, I'm going to show you how to use the new nodes in Blender 4.2 to create this modifier. I also recommend you to check out the other video that I made about the new matrix socket, because that's something that we're going to be using in this video. I also made a video on the Blender YouTube channel about node tools that you should check out before this to get started on the basics of how to create node tools in Blender. So let's get started. There are a few new features for node tools in Blender 4.2 to make it possible to interact with the 3D viewport. One aspect of this is a feature to wait for a mouse click when the tool is called. This can be combined with the information of the mouse position and the viewport transform to click exactly where you want the operation to happen. And in this video, I will show you exactly how to set this up. We will start this setup already with two node groups in place that you can get from the download from the example file. One is the impact fracture node, which will do the actual geometry operation that we want to do by cutting into the mesh repeatedly around a center point. And then the other one we'll use on top of that to create some variation and explode the individual pieces that we've cut to make it more visible. We're not going to create these from scratch, but just use them from the demo file to save some time and focus on the things that really matter for the new features in Blender 4.2. So let's take a look at these new nodes. Let's add the mouse position node. And you can see that there is the mouse X and Y position, which is in pixels, and the region width and height. Both of those are regarding the region of the viewport that you're executing the tool from. If I just connect one of these to the group output and then execute the tool in edit mode, you can see the individual values as I hover over the outputs. We can use this, for example, to calculate the relative position of the mouse in the region. That is something that we're going to need later. So let's turn the mouse position into a vector with a combine x, y, z node and do the same thing with the region size. Then we need to divide one by the other and map it to a different range. So dividing by the region size will make sure that instead of pixels, now these values go from zero to one. We can check that by also connecting this to the output to make sure that this is being evaluated. And then when we run the tool, you can see the relative position of the mouse. Now to get a little bit more control, let's go to the options menu here and turn on the wait for click feature. This will make sure that the evaluation of the note tree only actually happens whenever we click after executing the tool. So if I click on the name of the tool here, we get a different icon for the cursor and the actual tool is only being executed whenever I click again. So now you can see the values from wherever we clicked after executing the tool. To make this relative mouse position a little bit more useful, I want to map it to a different range. So let's use the map range node. And then instead of going from zero to one, I want to map it to going from negative one to one. But let's make sure to zero out all those Z components since we're dealing with a 2D vector. And now let's execute the tool again, clicking somewhere in the middle of the viewport. And then this gives us a value around zero, which is exactly what we want. So this is the relative mouse position that we'll need. Next, let's find out some information about the 3D viewport that we're looking at. So let's add the viewport transform node. And this one presents us with two matrices and a Boolean input. The matrices help you with the space transformation for the viewport. One is for the camera projection and the other one for the transformation of the viewport. And this Boolean just tells you whether the projection of the camera is orthographic. For now, let's just simply use the view transformation matrix to find out from what point we are actually looking as the viewer. Here, I'm not going to go into detail about math or how different projections and transformations work. 
I'm just going to show you how you can get this specific effect to work. There are plenty of learning resources online to figure out more about this kind of concept if you want to. The view transform matrix gives us the transformation into camera space. So to get the location of the camera in our object space, we need to invert the matrix. And from that, we can separate the individual transform components. Now this translation here gives us the exact position of the viewpoint. So wherever we are looking from at this cube will be the translation here. Let me prove this to you by adding a mesh line node, setting this to endpoints and connecting the translation to both. And let's just replace the output of the tool with this geometry. So now wherever this location that we just calculated is, the tool is going to create a bunch of points. So let's just run the tool, click. And now if I zoom out, you can see that the points are exactly where I was looking from. Try it again. And there you go. Let's bring back our cube and then add some more nodes. This here is going to be our viewpoint. The goal with this setup is to create a raycast from the viewpoint, so from where we are looking to the direction of the cursor. So as we are looking at the cube, we want to cast a ray from the source of our view to where we're pointing. The viewpoint as the source we already have, as well as the relative mouse position in the window. All that is left to do is figure out the direction that we're pointing in. For that, we can use the relative mouse position in combination with a little bit of matrix math. Again, here I will just apply the math without giving too much background. But essentially, we need to do both the transformation and the projection of the coordinates into view space. So we combine these two matrices using a multiply matrices node, and then inverting the result to get the opposite transformation. And this we can use to project the relative mouse position from view space into the object space using the project point node. And plugging in the previous transformation, this gives us the point that we're clicking on in 3D. So let me use the previous mesh line setup to prove what that looks like by connecting this to the end location. Now if I run the tool, you can see how we get a short line that is exactly going in the direction of our click. And things are going to be a little bit more clear once we actually do the ray casting. So let's do that next. Let's add a raycast node. And as the target geometry, we're going to use our group input. And then for the source position of the raycast, we can simply use the viewpoint. And for the direction, we need to calculate the difference between the two points that we just got. So we use a subtract node and then subtract the viewpoint from the point that we click on. And that will be the ray direction. To visualize the result of this raycast, let's still use our mesh line. We simply need to swap out the end location with the hit location of that raycast. Let's join the result of the mesh line with our cube and try this out. And there you go. A nice simple setup to get exactly the line of our raycast from the point where you're viewing from to the point that we're clicking on in the 3D viewport raycast it onto our geometry. So this is the basic setup for the raycasting that you can use in all sorts of contexts now. To use the information of both the orientation of the viewport and your position of the mouse to make tools more interactive. So now we have all the information that we need and let's connect the operation of the fracturing. Let's get rid of this mesh line setup because we don't need this anymore and instead put in the impact fracture node. For the center point we can simply plug in our hit position, and for the direction, we can take the direction of the raycast. Let's bump up the iterations to something like 20, and take a look if that works. Yeah, that's already working great. But one thing right now is that it's not working super well whenever we have multiple mesh islands already fractured. What I want to do is to only apply the fracture operation on the mesh island or 
cell that I am clicking on. So let's include that mechanism in the setup. For that, we can use the existing raycast operation. Let's change the data type to integer and add a mesh island node. Here we can sample the island index of the geometry that we are hitting with the raycast. So that way we know which mesh island we're actually clicking on. This information we can use to separate the geometry. We can just compare the island index with the result of the raycast. That way we separate the geometry of the mesh island that we click on from the rest. So let's only create the fracture on the selection and then afterwards join it back with the remaining geometry. Let's take a look at how that works. And there you go. Now there are just a few more things left to do. Let's reset our cube. And then I want to control the selection of this tool as well. Let's set the selection after we join the geometry back to just the selection of the fracture. That way we only select the freshly fractured parts of the mesh. And on top of this as a last piece, I just want to add the randomize operation. That will create a more interesting result by breaking up the shape. Let's make this tool a little bit more useful by exposing some of the parameters. Simply use the existing inputs from these node groups and drag and drop some inputs. The seed we can reuse also for the random islands operation. And then let's also expose these two. So now we have some additional control in the tool settings. The last thing that I want to do is add some additional randomization. Right now, whenever we execute the tool, it has the exact same seed, so we get the same pattern for the fracturing, unless we change the seed manually. But there's a small trick that I want to apply using one of the new nodes. Since we're probably not going to click in the exact same spot again, we can just use the mouse position to give us a random input. So on top of the seed, we can add a random value a random integer, let's say between negative 10,000 to positive 10,000, that we create from the mouse X and mouse Y as the ID and the seed. And this is what we use for the seed instead. So we both have a manual seed that we can pick in combination with a random seed, depending on our mouse position. We can also swap that out with the seed we use for the randomization of the islands. Let's get ourselves a new cube. And there you go. That's the fracturing tool done. And that's it. So that should get you up to speed to create more interactive custom tools for Blender 4.2 and onwards. Bye.